surprisingly enough, by the time you finished your first day of talking about it, most of the story is pretty much there. But I mean, we we put together really the outline for what most scripts would be done. We put the outline together very quickly. Uh, I didn't ever think it would really see the light of day. I thought it would be like maybe get a bunch of people together for a week and fill them out, spend another week like knocking together a rough edit and go, oh yeah, that was interesting. But it kind of snowballed a little bit and we ended up actually, you know, making a full thing and getting a few pounds from here and there to, to finance it. Sort of thing of with anything low budget, uh, you still have to, you know, be trying to do outside things at the same time. It's very difficult to devote your time fully to a project like this. But uh, the time that you can give, it's uh, stressful but very, very fun. Myself and Ambrose were just wrapping up on Hollow Girl and we were in post-production for it and we decided to take a... We, we'd been in all summer editing it and what, doing the sound and so, uh, such for that. So we decided one day just to take a spin out. It was a nice sort of sunny day and as we were driving around we kind of started thinking like about doing a, a feature, just like a road movie, travelling from place A to place B. There's someone following them. Kind of a mumblecore kind of thing. Um, maybe three or four actors, uh, three or four crew, a f sort of five or six day shoot um, just to kind of just to try it and play around with the idea you know uh, we then came back we got Steve on board and kind of bounced a few days around with him and he uh, he came he had a few ideas for uh, different stuff like to do a cult and whatnot and I've always been interested in cults so I was like yeah grand let's do that and we sort of just talked about it and the idea sort of became shackled uh, so the idea with this was that we would come together uh, like we had on a lot of other stuff in the past and come up with an outline for the, the story because the one thought was that everybody wanted to, to actually just make a film but they wanted to get into making the film as quickly as possible and waiting around for me to finish a full feature film script was going to be too long by the time that who knows how long that would take so it was thought that everyone should have the more of an opportunity to develop their skills by going going to do a film with a mostly improvised script uh, film without much in the way of things like uh, dolly rigs and all the rest of it that had been used in hollow girl so mostly handheld camera mostly natural lighting and the idea was to make it as um, to really more be a case of learning how to how to get actors to to act rather than worrying about you know, having everyone standing around for three hours while a dolly track gets laid. Now, it changed a fair bit um, from the first pitch to try and make it feasible to to actually fill in what we wanted to do, you know. But yeah, it was pretty much that. Like, we, we just decided we were going to do a, a feature just to try it out. Like, we didn't really think it would um, be more than... Like, the whole thing was an experiment. Just to go, it would be nice to... We, I, I felt I'd learned a huge amount from doing Hollow Girl and I really wanted to do another, uh, I wanted to just try out doing a feature film, more stuff. Um, so I figured, well, a feature film is good enough. Like, it, it was mostly a learning thing. So the fact that the story was going to be put together very quickly um, didn't really bother me much at the time, um, partly because I was only being involved in generating it in the first place, but mainly because it wasn't going to be like it, it, it wasn't going to be a gigantic investment of people's um, cash or anything like that, so to speak. So like it was, it was, it was mostly for people to learn the stuff that would that they would learn while making it and finishing it, rather than putting it together in the first place. When it came to casting, what we did was we posted up just that we were looking for for actors on various sort of uh, filmmaking forums, actors forums, and so on. Everyone got in touch with us. We we got like all these headshots in. We looked through them all, decided who would sort of fit what characters, who was completely right out. So we kind of lined them all up as to who they could, were sort of eligible or feasible to play. Then had a few phone calls and chatted to them. I uh, chatted to people who I thought were suitable over the phone and just sort of saw like, you know, that they understood what the project was and how we were doing it and how it was sort of an improv thing and how um, it was, we were shooting against this kind of schedule and whatnot. And then just arranged to meet up with people um, met up with a couple of folks, just chatted them about the characters and all that, sort of saw if they understood, again, understood the characters and just chatted for a bit and saw if they were decent people or not really. Um, Shackled, I saw a posting on one of the websites, I can't remember which one it was at the time, but um, saw Shackled 
a few things piqued my interest. Um, one of them was that it was going to be an improvised film. Um, I like doing a bit of bit of improv, so uh, I gave. I think it was Dave. I gave uh, a call, and Ambrose and and Dave turned up at the house to discuss the role and. Uh, once I knew that it was going to be a structured improv film, I was very happy with that um, because there's nothing worse than having an improvised film that uh, nobody has a clue what they're supposed to be doing in and it's not structured. So um, that's really what attracted me to it, apart from the role of Jacob Lowry, which I really liked. It was a really strong character and uh, I, I, something I could really get my teeth into. Sarah loses her brother and they go on a mission to find out what happened to the brother. She's a she's quite independent and I thought she was she was an easy enough character to play even though she had parts of her that were in depth with the funeral and mourning the loss of a brother and stuff like that. But putting that all aside, I think she was just the girl next door. So I think she wasn't too difficult of a character to get into. Well, I always, I always actually had a childish weakness for these kind of horror films from back in the 70s with the Hammer Dracula films and things like that, and even, um, you know, this kind of zombie-like things like that. That was a bit childish. I never admitted to that in public. And H.P. Lovecraft books, which I discovered Dave McCabe was also a, a geeky fan of. Um, so that, I suppose, really. With the crew, a lot of them were actually local film people like who we'd worked with on previous films over the years and we got to know through the likes of Hollow Girl and whatnot. I had, I'd worked with, obviously I'd worked with Ambrose like for years uh, in the company. I'd worked with Ashling, who was the other uh, kind of key camera person. I worked with her on the film before Five Days Shelter. The masks we just got from a local arts and craft store, I'm not even certain what they're for, um, but we picked up a load of ones and then we got, the robes were made by our photographer Elaine. Um, who again we'd worked with before? Uh, she she was our, our she does the photography for lots of our, our various little projects here and there, and um, turns out her auntie is a sort of a seamstress. So her auntie Dimfna, we asked her and she kind of g g g did us a real good deal on getting the, the material cut and then sewing it into all the, the robes and whatnot. It was it like eleven black ones and a white one or something like that? I think it was nine and one, but. Um, the, the chalice itself, that was actually the most difficult part. We couldn't find anything. And like it was around Halloween, we kind of, we thought we might find some props or something like that. It was very difficult to find something. The one we got was, it was all right, but the problem is it's a little bit disco ball-y, which, again, it didn't look terrible. It's just that it reflects, it reflects a lot of light and whatnot, but we had like a matte spray as so we sprayed all over and, and kind of dulled the sheen from it. Um, but it's, I mean, apart from that, I quite like it. It's got a ni nice texture and it sort of, it looks really interesting, you know, all the kind of cracks across it and whatnot. Um, but it would took us a lot, it was difficult to find that. The guns we got from uh, an armorer, Jude Steins, who we'd gotten guns off him before for a film called Striking Air, which is all like just a, a Russian roulette kind of thing. Um, but so we worked with him before and gotten stuff off him, which is grand. So we got um, a couple of pistols and, and the shotgun and that off him. Um, it was 11 days of principal photography. Um, yeah, so we shot it for, it was 11 days, 11 full long days. And there was a break in between, I think. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was like something like, shot for six days and shot for five days. Six days, one day off, five days back on. Then we got, we, we did a rough edit of the whole thing and then we shot for another we shot for another 11 days, but the second set of 11 days were all like maybe an hour or two here. It was all really short, but there were there was still 11, another 11 days, but probably had it all been a, like, you know, a long days again, it might have been another two or three days, give or take. So, yeah, I would say roughly two weeks of shooting. It was very off the cuff. There wasn't a lot of time to um, set up lights or cameras. <laughs> So anything that we could do was a big help. Everything was reflected off something that was reflected off something else, off something else to try light somebody's face. So when we did have time like for the, um, the dream sequences and that, was, it was really fun to play around with. And I think that was what I was most proud of. I think it's a good idea to shoot things very quickly because um, if, there, 
I find if there are long gaps between between scenes and that, it, it, sometimes it's a problem. But when when you when you're up against a schedule that's really quick, you're you you're the character the whole time. You don't really get a chance to, to let it go or, or or that you know. So that was that was a blessing, I suppose, in one way. Um, there was a lot covered, a lot of action scenes and there's a lot of driving, um, which was fun to do. But it, it was fast paced. I, I liked the pace of the shoot. I thought it, thought it was good to keep the keep the energy going with, with the movie, you know, with the film. Well, I suppose with my character, um, there was only a couple of scenes, so I didn't really feel it as much as maybe some of the other guys, like like uh, Andy and Donna, where they would have been on side like all day, every day, whereas I was only coming in for bits and pieces, so I didn't feel it as much. And I kind of think it, it added to the excitement anyhow. I think most people would say that. The fast-paced nature was grand. I mean, I, I had done the schedule, and I kind of knew how much time he had for everything so I was fairly aware of that and as I say when Dave Ryan came on as our first AD the schedule was already done his job was just to time keep and to make sure that everyone was ready for the next stuff and it flowed reasonably well I mean we hit all I mean we, we, we shot everything inside the schedule that we'd set like a scene was given two hours it took two hours as simple as that if travel was half an hour travel was half an hour I'd done scheduling before like so I was happy enough I, 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 that all the times were right I mean Everything had to be, because everyone was done so tightly. I mean, we, we ran to schedule, but that meant that sometimes we wouldn't light a scene or sometimes we'd shoot a scene the wrong way or we may not have enough time to get the perfect performance or to, if we were lucky, we could, if an actor wanted to redo a scene, we had time to, sometimes we didn't. And we had to use, I, I, I thought we, we got it, but I like to let actors retake a scene if they want, because you never know, they, they, they're in a different kind of space. They're focused solely on their performance. They might catch something or be aware of something that's going through their head that would be expressed in their, in their eyes or whatever that you might not see because you're dealing with three or four actors and cameras. And at the very least, I'd like to let them get out of their head, you know, so that they're not thinking about it in the next scene, you know. So if we had time, we'd let them reshoot it. Um, but we were up against time quite a bit. Uh, well, there's a lot of the, the especially the, the mythology, the, the background of the cult and everything that, um, that I was sort of finding out as, as the film went on, because this was, you know, it was a very, very quick paced thing where uh, it was w within a very short period of getting the part that uh, we're shooting. And um, so the first thing you do with Enton is look at your own character and the stuff he does. And, um, and like I say, most of his stuff was, uh, was much more grounded in the present of like, follow what your dad's saying, do this stuff, try and get all this stuff over with. And he doesn't care too much about the background, so. I wasn't looking at that immediately, but as the, the shoot was progressing and even just talking to, to the director and to everybody and, and looking better at the script, looking in more depth at the script to find out uh, uh, what it was all about. And um, it was uh, very interesting and very made for a very entertaining film, I think. When we were running around the forest and stuff, and when we were running around the house with the piano music and the lads are like... Dun, 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 dun. Or waiting around just being dressed as a cultist and doing... Yeah. It things that cultists do, like in a drink coffee. House. <laughs> like, cultists oh, yeah. drinking coffee. Yeah, <laughs> Take Fred, a picture. So it was like a week for it, a week joke. Yeah. <laughs> it was really cool because we were scaring each other. Yeah, you just got to turn to see this bit of a face. You're was. like, who is that? But we were really good. We were really on the ball for that because everyone knew not to be like right in front of the camera, but to be creeping out of random places and scaring. It was grand. I mean, we, we'd spoken about the scenes and we had an outline for every scene. And we spoke to the actors and they kind of worked through. We get them to while everyone was being sort of set up, we get them to run through the scene a couple of times. And then I go, well, look, this bit's good. Can we drop this bit of information or can you put this bit in here, you know? Um, it was okay. I much preferred when. I mean, with, with everything else is going on in a way, sometimes it's a little bit hard to gauge what was working and what wasn't working. They, they were quite believable performances. Um, and the, as I said before, the dialogue was quite real, but the problem is it's almost too real. Um, I much preferred when we had scripted, for, for, the, for the, the pickups, we scripted uh, the scenes and then got them to improv around that, which meant that the pacing of it was much clearer. Um, they knew what information to drop in. The characters were a bit more solid and they had something to fall back on whenever they kind of went, oh, what will I say here? That you know, they, it was like a, giving them sort of a skeleton to kind of build the the conversation around. And I think in those scenes, like early on in the film, we have the two girls in the cafe. That's that's the first one I can recall. 
it's the earliest scene I can recall that actually is scripted, you know. And you'll see the difference between it and the, sort of the, the scenes beforehand. The information is the same in both scenes, but one scene has a lot more um, and okays and yeah and repeating the information. Whereas those scenes, there's not that much sort of filler, uh, like filler sounds, and there's not that much repetition. They're much more, they, they flow much more like film conversations should, even though they're not line by line um, off the script, you know, it just gives them a sort of a framework. I would much prefer to have done that, and that's how I would do it from now on. It's scripted, and then let them play around with it. It was the first time working with improv, and I have to say, improv scared me. Um, it, it had its good points and its bad points. Good that you had the freedom to do what you wanted to do or do what the character. Uh, but then you felt like you had to overtell the story so that the audience got what was going on and that kind of got in the way a few times. Um, as I said, once, once it was structured, it was fine. I mean, uh, the, 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 the scenes where it had a beginning, a middle and an end, there were certain things that had to be said within, within the, the confines of the, of the scenes but you had free reign to, to improvise the dialogue after that, which was great. It gives you, it gives you, um, it gives you great freedom as an actor to, to, to let fly with, with what you really want to do in a scene. Um, I suppose the, with Shackle there was a varying degree of experience with doing improv, um, and it seemed to work out fine in the end, you know. I mean, most of my scenes were with Sarah and that, which which were great, you know. I mean, there is a danger with, with improvised uh, scenes where, where you either say too much or you don't say anything. But there was a nice balance there between between us uh, in the family, in the Lowry family, which was, which was good. It was interesting, actually. It was, it was, uh, it was fun. I remember speaking with Ambrose and David, uh, you know, leading up to filming and uh, just some ideas that you had that, you know, different um, real life cults that, that had, that had uh, you know, been found out and different things that had happened and just to look up that and the different kind of um, mechanism that they use and the different communities that they had together and uh, the language that they used. So I looked up all of that and I found it just so interesting. Um, you know how how people can get so swept into all of this, and you, you you can you start to understand it. You start to kind of you're looking at these things, and you're thinking, oh my God, being a part of a community like that, and you really get brought into it. Obviously, the outcomes aren't particularly uh, tend not to not to work well, but the idea is there. Um, the initial idea was right, and I used a lot of that, and that was really interesting. So I created a lot, a lot of script from those kind of things that I that I watched, and it was quite easy to improvise from that point of view. Well, I suppose one thing that stuck in my mind, as I said before, I've never been professionally involved in drama, but the 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 guy playing the hero, uh, yeah, he. I mean, I came there one time to do the shoot, and he was doing a shoot at the same time, and what. He had to do involved running into a room, grabbing a shotgun off the wall and running out again. And um, I went there and I was sitting down and I saw him go out and he was getting into the, he was doing a warm up, if you like to say, and he was out in the yard doing press ups and getting himself all kinds of into the, and I thought, should I be doing something like that? I mean, that's, should, this is this how it, this is what it's done. Should I just be doing this? And then I looked at well, what am I going to be called to do in my scene? And it involved making coffee and giving it. So I thought, well, I can do that. So I went and made myself a cup of coffee and sat down. So I thought that's adequate enough preparation for what I'm doing. The editing process was disastrous. We lost a lot of time along the way. Um, we had to change the editor. We had to change, go through two special effects guys before we decided to, to divvy the work up amongst myself and Amber was decided to divvy it between ourselves. Um, <sighs> well, when the shoot was over, we gave all the footage to the editor. I think there was about 36 hours worth of footage all together. And he started working away at it. And um, after about three months, I think, he just, I don't think he just kept his head around it. I mean, there was a lot of footage there, and because of the nature of the shoot with the improvised dialogue and everything, I just don't think he could uh, really get his head around that in terms of constructing scenes together. Unfortunately, because we'd lost those three months, by the time we actually knew what scenes needed to be rewritten, and our lead actor had flown back to Australia. Now, we would have had the time 
to get our pickups and whatnot otherwise so it sort of was snowballed um, as everything this film seems to have done it snowballed and we kind of lost we couldn't do the few pickups with Andy we wanted to do and anyone who had pickups with Andy we couldn't do those so we could only do about half the pickups we planned for which was you know as I say unfortunate so I took over then in February 2010 and for about just three months I kind of locked myself in the room and just got it done, you know, there was no other option. And then we, a couple of drafts later, we looked at it and we decided to do a few reshoots. And um, we did the reshoots and then there was about two or three more weeks of uh, editing after that. So I think the editing process altogether took about four months. And then I gave it off to Dave and Dave started the grade on it and doing the special effects and things like that. Well, the special effects guys, uh Essentially, they had to be changed because they'd taken on to the work and just as, as it was going along, their dedication didn't seem to be... They, they weren't really behind it. They, didn't, they weren't willing to put the work in and also they'd seem to have sort of taken on the bit enough more they could chew. They couldn't do the effects that were required. And, they, you know, they were only kind of throwing the odd air into here and there, so it wasn't getting done. So in the end, we kind of had to, to, to remove them. Removed the first guy, same problem with the second guy, and eventually just went, oh, here, look, we'll find a way to do it ourselves. Then we went on to the sound design, and we got in um, Nicky Moss, and he brought it, it through Windmill Lane and such. Mark Henry did the, all that kind of stuff. They designed the sounds and did all the mixes. We got Martin Brannigan, um, who I'd worked with in Hollow Girl, and he's fantastic, uh, really easy guy to work with, really nice guy, and a great musician to score to score it. And he again had, as I said, um, I wouldn't work too, we, we kind of, deadlines kind of came up like for festivals and stuff and we kind of figured we'd put the film into them. But uh, on hindsight, I mean, it, it didn't really, it, the film may maybe would have done reasonably well had it entered those when it was complete. But because it was incomplete and we rushed it to get it complete, then it wasn't completed properly. And so it sort of suffered along the way. I think the score is great, especially considering the amount of time Martin had. Like he was just working all day, every day on, on getting it. It was a really enjoyable shoot and it was really relaxed and comfortable and everybody was at ease and everyone was very supportive of each other. Like I even remember sitting in on some of the other actors' scenes and likewise. And it was a real, really supportive um, environment. It was our community. Um, I mean, I'd done a lot of project management stuff uh, from my engineering and that. So the, t the time we could work inside and we did work inside it, but it's, you know, that quality triangle thing where you've got like, you know, on one point you've got fast, then you've got cheap, and then you've got good. And you can only ever have two points. So if you do, you know, if you do it fast uh, and good, it's not going to be cheap. You're going to have to sink a lot of money into it. Uh, if you want it to be, if you want it to be, cheap and fast it's not going to be good <laughs> and, and, and so on and so forth i think we sort of hit some in the middle we got it done fairly cheaply we got it done fairly quickly and it's not terrible um but it wasn't it wasn't super cheap it wasn't super fast and it wasn't super great like so as i say sort of that quality triangle um and so yeah if we if we'd sat down and figured that out at the beginning maybe we would have gone maybe we shouldn't try shoehorn into the year but as i say it was an experiment and an experience one of the words that was used at the beginning was experimental. I don't like the word experimental because usually with an, a, something that starts off as an, as an experiment, when you're into it, you see something better. And most of the time people say, well, we shouldn't have shot it as an experiment. We should have shot it for, uh, as a real step-by-step -step film, which would turn out better. Um, the thing about Shackled is that even though it was an experiment, it turned out very, very well. Yeah, I learned, I learned loads. I'm no longer afraid of, of improv uh, after, after doing Shackled. Uh, I learned loads, I have to say. It was great to be on set for two weeks. Um, and then you bounce off other actors like Brian and Jerry, the ones that were there. You can learn loads from them, met lots of great people, still friends with most of the people that were involved. So I couldn't ask for any more. It's not, I mean, I think the overall story works really well. It's got a, a kind of a good opening thing. It's gripping, 
you, you see there's the murder, there's the guy that breaking into the house, there's the weird dream stuff. It's got a really action-paced ending. You know, I, I like the ending, I love the music for it. I think the, the fight scene is really cool. The, the cutting between the real world and the dream world stuff I think works really well. I was really happy with all that. There's bits in the middle where there's a bit too much exposition. I don't think the chase scene in the hospital is as exciting as it could be. I think the middle is a bit pudgy. It could have done with tightening up, like with a few pickups here and there and such. But I think it's got a good enough beginning that you'll stick with it. I think there's enough stuff going on throughout it, like the dreams and stuff, um, that will keep you watching. I think the end is a good payoff. Uh, I am happy with it. I, I, I would like to have done it differently and, you know, maybe someday, maybe the next thing will, well, hopefully the next thing, the, no, the next thing will be more polished. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say on the matter. 